What is going on, Laker fans? Uh, thank you very much for being a part of the show. Lakers talk tonight will go till 8 p.m. Jovan Buha is going to join me in about a half hour, and we got a lot to get into coming off that loss uh, last night, Lakers and the uh, Indiana Pacers. So uh, you heard it right there. You could hear in John and Michael's voice. Obviously, they were stunned. Anthony Davis post game that this one's going to sting. He's not lying. Uh, but we got to move on from that game. There's a couple things I will still kind of look back on. There's some takeaways from yesterday's game that I want to get into. I think that's a little bit more bigger picture. Um, but I appreciate you guys being a part of the show. Phone number is 877-710-ESPN. If um, you want to talk Lakers basketball, that's uh, the primary reason why we do this show on Monday night So or Tuesday night tonight. Lakers played last night. Feel free to uh, shoot us a call, and, uh, and we'll talk some hoops. Okay, um, real quick on last night, devastating how it all went down. Um, couldn't really put – I couldn't properly explain what happened in the postgame show because I don't know what happened. It just all happened so quick. I mean, you know, obviously a 17-point lead. Yesterday was the biggest fourth-quarter lead – uh, blown fourth quarter lead, 17 points in the NBA so far this season. I know we're not 80 games in, but it just kind of, you know, obviously shows how unique yesterday's loss was, especially you're at home. You know, you're playing the Indiana Pacers. It's not like you're playing the Warriors and it was Steph and Clay went off and Jordan Poole and it's guys that have done it before. It's not like you were playing the Celtics and there's a championship team. It was the Indiana Pacers. I'm, trying, I'm not trying to disrespect them. But it's the Indiana Pacers, and, you know, you're at home. You thought the Lakers would close it out. Um, I think it's one of those games that as the season progresses, we're going to go back and talk about that game a lot. In my experience of just watching sports, watching the NBA, you always have games. It's not just the Lakers. not exclusive to the Lakers. Every single team has these, right, where you're getting closer towards the end of the season and you start remembering certain games and you say – damn, if we could have just got that W against X, whoever that team is, right? It happens in the NFL. It happens in Major League Baseball. It happens in um, – it certainly happens in the NBA. That will be one of those games that we will look back on. I guarantee you, whether I'm doing Lakers talk, whether I'm doing the post-game show, the pre-game show, or I'm talking with Travis in the mornings, um, that game will come up multiple times between now and the end of the season. Um, that's, uh, just how unfortunate that the Lakers were, but it was all on the Lakers. It's not, you know, I, I heard a lot of people, even today I was hearing so much of this. Oh my gosh. When I'm, every time I hear somebody trying to break down the final play and say, oh, well, if the Lakers could have just done this and if they grab, grab that instead of that offensive rebound for the Pacers, well, Le- LeBron should have closed quicker. I, I mean, I just, I, I can't, I get like a migraine hearing people talking about the final play. They didn't lose a game in the final play. They were up 17 points with nine and a half minutes left to go. Um, It's always frustrating. I I thought the Lakers is the equivalent of a prevent defense in the NFL, right? We just don't want to lose. Hey, hey, just keep the guys in front of you. Hey, you know what? If they get a first down, fine. Just don't let them go deep and uh, and score on you. You're up two scores. We're fine. Let's just you know, let's just slow. Let's just make sure that um, that we just hold on to this lead. And usually, what happens there is you lose the game. And you know, some of the things that take away. And I'm gonna this is gonna lead to a LeBron AD conversation that I want to have. Lakers stopped moving the ball, obviously, in that fourth quarter. Um, Darvin, Darvin Ham took the blame. I'm going to just read a quote here of what he said. He said, you get a lead like that, the free throw line allows you to maintain your lead, and I wish we would have been a lot more aggressive. Continued playing with pace. He's right. Whatever, However they built the lead, they went completely away from that. So it's, it's kind of funny, and it happens in sports all the time. You're sitting there telling yourself, all right, um, we have – this is how we built our lead – So why don't we continue using that same methodology that got us there? Instead, for the Lakers, they stopped going away from it. So that's what he's talking about. The team wasn't aggressive. All of a sudden, the pace stopped. He said, and also continue to be organized and move the ball. That falls on me. That falls on me. I'll take the responsibility. Here's, I think there's a question that I had. I might have even brought it up a week ago during Lakers talk. This, to me, is the real question right now around around the Lakers. Who should be the focal point for the Lakers moving forward? Who should it be? There's only two options. It's either LeBron James 
or to Anthony Davis. Either the focal point of the Lakers is built around LeBron James or it's built around Anthony Davis. Something happened here over the course of the last two weeks where, you know, obviously there's a lot of optimism towards those numbers AD was pulling up over that two-week stretch. Why wouldn't there be? AD hasn't put up numbers like that since that, you know, championship around the Lakers had in 2020. Or go back to his New Orleans days where, you know, you would, uh, you'd wake up in the morning and you'd go to ESPN or you're watching SportsCenter late at night and you're like, damn, this dude, Anthony Davis with the Pelicans, this guy put up 50 and 20? Did he have a 45 and 25 night? Those are the type of numbers that AD used to put up with the Pelicans. He was the focal point of that franchise and that organization. Everything ran through Anthony Davis. Now the last couple of years, um, and by the way, that was a vision with the Lakers. It's not like the Lakers thought, the front office thought, I'm assuming this, I don't know it, but I'm just assuming this is what the game plan was for the Lakers. You trade everything you got to go get Anthony Davis, Team AD up with LeBron James. Those two are going to go out, try to win an NBA championship together, which they accomplished. But eventually, how many times have we had this conversation? Eventually, LeBron is going to hand that baton to Anthony Davis. Two straight years AD is injured. That obviously never comes to fruition. Um, Bron's doing his thing. Bron averaged 30 points last year in his 19th season in the NBA. And then this year starts. And the Lakers start the season out 2-10. and 10. Braun misses some games. And AD just starts putting up some absolutely monster numbers that I don't care. It, you know, uh, you could be somebody that loves Anthony Davis' game. You could be somebody that hates Anthony Davis. Wherever you stand on AD, wherever you stand, if you're an NBA fan, AD put up numbers over that four-game stretch that were, when I say historic, I'm not trying to be dramatic, there's compare it's Wilt, it's Hakeem that did it one time. They're throwing out, you know, obviously these great big men that did this and did that. It's been this long since this has been accomplished. The 30 and uh, 21 and the five blocks and five steps. I mean, he was just, he was amazing. So in my head, I thought during that stretch, hey, what we were hoping for a couple years ago from Anthony Davis, maybe it's a couple years late simply because AD has been basically playing half the amount of games the last two seasons. But damn, maybe it's here. I mean, the dude's only 29 years old, so let's not pretend like he's 35 or something along those lines. My my kind of thought, my idea, my concept is I think we're at that stage where this team is no longer LeBron James' team. It's Anthony Davis's team. And this is no knock on LeBron James. This is just the reality. He's in his 20th season in the NBA. He's played over 300 playoff games, which is about three and a half additional seasons. Bron has logged the minutes. He's been the greatest player um, in the NBA for X amount of years. This is a good thing if Anthony Davis is getting to a point where it's, all right, guys, I mean, this is getting a little obvious here. I'm the main guy. I'm the main focal point. The reason why I bring that up is I think this is an adjustment for everybody. LeBron James never walked on a basketball floor probably since he was 15 years old and didn't think he was the best player. Actually, at 15, he probably knew he was the best player. At 12, he probably knew he was the best player. LeBron's been the best player every time he walks on the floor. And last week I was mentioning it. I was talking about this is going to be the first time. This is is going to be a real adjustment for LeBron James if – Anthony Davis is putting up, you know, close to some of the numbers that he was putting up over these last couple of uh, couple of weeks and the Lakers are winning games. Um, I, I find myself, you know, when I say who should be the focal point for the Lakers moving forward, to me, it's an easy answer. Of course, it's Anthony Davis. Of course, it's Anthony Davis. And I really do feel like that has been the plan for the Lakers, but I think that plan has been delayed because of AD's health. Now, I'm going to throw this question out to Laker fans. Whose responsibility is it for AD to take over this team? Whose responsibility is it? Travis and I were talking about this morning, and we were kind of going through, you know, just, all right, is this on Darvin Ham to, um, 
to make sure that everybody on this team and this roster knows and understands, uh, guys, everything runs. A- Anthony Davis is the focal point. That's the new foundation of the Los Angeles Lakers. It's Anthony Davis. And again, I, I say this with optimism. That's what you want. LeBron's not supposed to be the best player 20th year in the league. He's not supposed to be. That means you don't have enough talent. That means you don't have another dominating player. And the Lakers obviously have that in Anthony Davis, but there's some things that, you know, obviously Anthony Davis is responsible for. So I throw out that question, who's responsible for AD to take over the team? Whose responsibility is it for AD to take over the team? Is it Darvin Ham? Is it LeBron James? Or is it only one person? It's on AD. That I was watching last night's game, and I was looking at some of their shot selection towards the end of the game. AD again had one of those nights where he only had two shots in the fourth quarter. I saw Braun take 22 shots. I saw Anthony Davis take 15 in my head. I'm like, why is that happening? Isn't isn't it supposed to be Anthony Davis that's taking the 22 shots? AD should be the one that's taking the bulk of the shots and run everything through Anthony Davis. I don't care. AD gets double teamed. Sounds good. AD's going to make the right decision. The dude is six foot eleven. He'll look over any defense. He's not a selfish dude. I think there's a lot of Lake fans wish he was more selfish. That doesn't seem like it's in his DNA. Um, whose responsibility is it for AD to take over this team? Because I really do believe this. If the Lakers have any shot of competing this year, and when I say competing, forget championship talk. I'm talking about making the playoffs and being a tough out. I'm talking about convincing the front office that you're close enough that it is it is the right thing to do for the future of this team to potentially trade some of those draft picks because you got a shot to compete this year. If everything does not start and stop with Anthony Davis, tell me how the Lakers are going to be a playoff team. I'll take some of your guys' phone calls when we come back. Phone number is 877-710-ESPN. And I want to give kind of my my version here of the responsibility AD has in this and the responsibility LeBron James has in this because I really do think it's actually just those two players. We'll do that coming up next. Uh, Appreciate you guys being a part of the show. Lakers Talk on 710 ESPN. Uh, Thank you to Valvoline Instant Oil Change. Takes about 15 minutes to go get your car service. Visit SoCalOilChange.com for location and game-winning coupons off your next Valvoline Instant Oil Change. We appreciate their partnership here on Lakers Talk. So talking a little bit about yesterday, but more I, I'm kind of talking big picture here. And I threw out this question to Laker fans. I know we got a lot of Laker fans that want to chime in on this. Um, whose responsibility is it for AD to take over this team? Look, I may... Um, I'm a firm believer in this. If the Lakers are going to make noise, AD's got to be your foundation, period. So let me use last night as an example. Last night, AD took two shots. Two shots. Anthony Davis took two shots last night. That's not okay. And I I put blame on everybody. That's not okay. Anthony Davis got to be one of those guys that is staring at each one of his teammates and saying, fellas, Do you really think we're going to win this game if I'm taking two shots? Do you really think it's a good idea for this franchise, for this team, for this organization with me taking two shots? Now, I could also see somebody else saying, AD, go go demand the ball. Go be the player. You want to go take – do you think you had to invite Kobe Bryant to go take over a game in the fourth quarter? No, you didn't. Do you think you had to tell LeBron James back in the day, hey, LBJ, would you be open to taking over the game in the fourth quarter? And he sits back, he thinks about it, he nods, he says, sounds good, guys, I'm going to do it. That's not what these players do. The best of the best, give me the damn ball, and if you don't give it to me, I'm going to find a way to get the ball, and I'm going to make sure I impact the game, and I'm going to close this thing out. That's what the best players do. So when I you know, I throw that question out, the response, but whose responsibility is it? I want to throw this two ways. I get it's AD's responsibility. I understand that. I'm not questioning that. But let me just, let me share it this way for a quick second. LeBron's one of the greatest players to ever play the game. Wherever you put him, it doesn't matter. You put him as the greatest, second, third, fourth, whatever, however you want to put your argument, you're not getting very far before you name off LeBron as one of the greatest to ever play the game. Anthony Davis is watching one of the greatest who's ever played the game. He's been a teammate with him for a while. They obviously have a really, really good relationship. 
Anthony Davis also doesn't have that personality, at least it doesn't seem like it to me, that's going to go tell a LeBron James, no, I'm getting the freaking ball, and, and, and walk away. Maybe, maybe LeBron would like that. I have no idea. But he doesn't seem like that's his personality. LBJ has got some responsibility in this, in my opinion. LeBron, you're in your 20th year in the NBA. Should you be taking 22 shots and Anthony Davis should be taking 15? Doesn't sound like today, at this stage of his career, like that's a good idea. I think there's got to be some combination here. I think AD needs LeBron James to tell him, my man, I've been doing it for how long? I would love to continue to do it, but have you seen how many minutes I've logged in my career? Have you seen... um, uh, all the responsibility that I've had in the past. Do you know players in their 20th year in the league uh, how the type of basketball they play when they get to this stretch of their career? I think AD, and maybe maybe I'm delusional here, I think he needs the okay from LeBron James. I think LeBron's got to be the one that I want to see him be more responsible in late-game situations and just in general in games. AD, you're the baddest player in the NBA. We're not winning without you. You got to take over this game. And actually, no, I'm going to keep feeding you the ball, and I'm not going to shoot the ball, and I'm not going to get in these isolation situations because I think the 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 individual that gives us the best chance to win is if you have the ball in your hands. Now you're asking one of the greatest players to ever play the game to rely on somebody else. And that doesn't sound like that's an easy thing to do for somebody who's literally one of the greatest to ever do it. So it's kind of an interesting dilemma for the Lakers that a week or a couple weeks ago when I saw AD doing what he was doing, I thought to myself, I'm like, how is Braun going to adjust? This isn't about Braun adjusting to Russell Westbrook when I see when I hear people say, oh, well, Braun should adjust. No, Braun shouldn't adjust, adjust to Russ. Russ's game doesn't. It's not good enough to compliment, to make, to tell LeBron, hey, you need to adjust. But Anthony Davis's game, no, that's good enough for LBJ to adjust to another player that is so integral to the Lakers today and, and so integral to the Lakers in the future. All right, I'm going to shut the hell up and take some calls here. Caesar in the LBC. What's going on, Caesar? Hey, how you doing, Slay? This uh, Caesar. Can you hear me clear? Yes, sir. I got you, bud. All right. Yeah, I just want to mention a couple of things. You know, starting off with yesterday's game, that was that was pretty painful. That was horrible. Um, but I think it's just a reflection of what's been going on with with AD LeBron and uh, and I think Ham's doing a great job. He's made, he's taking the best out of the team. And uh, when it comes to LeBron, like you said, they don't, he doesn't want to pass the baton to AD. You know, for example, yesterday we were up by 11. There was a little under four minutes left, 22 seconds left on the shot clock, and he, he shot a three-point shot. That, that was ridiculous. Yo, shot 10 have, of them. Okay, shot 10 three threes three. yesterday. Let me, let, let me hold back a little, and let me, let me, let's take our time. Let's take the time out, and let's, uh, you know, restart this and make sure we don't, we don't drop the ball. You know, but what happened? He shot a three, 22 seconds shots left, uh, in the uh, seconds of the shot, and the shot clock left, and he missed it, and that's when the Indiana made their second run. You know, not Caesar, a Caesar, I'm, I'm, I'm going jump to for, I'm, I'm jump in for a quick second. I appreciate you calling in because I want to take more of these calls. I got Yovan coming up here uh, shortly. So I'm, I'm actually – I'm okay with – let's say Braun has a game like yesterday where he ended up taking 20 shots. My issue is this. My issue is I want everything to start with AD. I want everything – you know, back in the day, it was Shaq and Kobe. And trust me. I'm sure Kobe Bryant, when he walked in the league at 18, now Kobe, that's a different DNA. Kobe thought, I'm the best player on the floor. Yeah, Kobe, I understand what you're saying, but Shaquille O'Neal, do you see how dominating this is? We haven't seen a player this dominant since named the big man in the NBA. Kobe's like, yeah, cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to come in earlier, and I'm just going to outwork everybody in this freaking gym till everybody thinks I'm the best player on the floor. Kobe had a different way of doing it. But things started on the inside, and it worked its way to the outside. That's all I'm talking about here. With Anthony Davis, let him get a touch every single time. Because you know what's going to happen? Yes, the double team's going to come. I get it. Other teams understand that Anthony Davis is so dominant. That makes all the sense in the world. AD is not going to be selfish and make a bad decision. AD gets to the basket. He's going to get to the free throw line. AD demands six, seven, eight, nine, ten shots in the fourth quarter. Good things are going to happen for the Lakers. But that three you're talking about LBJ took? 
Do you know how much more open LeBron's going to be if the ball starts with Anthony Davis? That's the only point that I'm trying to make. I feel like if if every if things run through Bron at this stage versus things running through AD at this stage, it's a big difference. And by the way, it's probably going to help Bron as well. You'll get better looks. Take another call here, David in Van Nuys. What's going on, David? Hey, Slee. Thanks for take thanks for taking my call, Slee. I feel like today I but I've been hit by a semi truck after yesterday's game, but. You know, you, you're you're completely right. I think Coach Ham needs to actually step in and say, hey, everything needs to go through AD because we clearly saw when LeBron was out, AD was killing it. And it needs to go through AD. And as far as yesterday, it was completely a team loss to break that 17 point and, and, and completely lose. But my other point is, if, if Ham was able to break into Russ and say, hey, you're better coming off the bench, why can't he break into LeBron and say, look, dude, we know you're the best player. 20 years, you know, you're, you're, you're a hell of a player. But right now, Anthony Davis is our guy. You need to start playing through Anthony Davis. And you're correct. If he plays through Anthony Davis, he is going to get better looks. But, you know, us Laker fans, we don't care if he's number one in the shooting, you know, the scoring list. We want wins. And Anthony Davis could get us the wins. Appreciate you calling it. Thank you for calling it. Let me see a couple more here. Raju in Covina, if I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah, you got it right, man. How you doing? Good, man. Thank you. I just wanted to say, I think you're right about a lot of points. I think it starts with AD. Nobody's in charge of their own destiny more than yourself. Uh, he's got to demand the ball two shots in the fourth quarter. It's kind of ridiculous. He should be to the point where LeBron is saying, hey, can I get some touches too? That's how aggressive I want him to be. Uh, then I think it steps down. You got to have the coach getting to telling the, uh, the team to get him the ball. LeBron's got to enforce it. And just to your point, when you got a guy like Kobe and Shaq, I don't think that they were begging for the ball. I missed the inside out game. I think AD has enough of a high basketball IQ where you could trust him to be double teamed and make the right decision. I think that's how Shaq did it. I feel like that's how Dwight Howard did it in the 2009 finals. And I just missed that style of basketball. I appreciate you calling in. Thank you for calling Raju. Um, I think everybody's got some responsibility. If I want to blame some stuff on Anthony Davis, AD, uh, you, you literally have the keys to the franchise. When they traded, when the Lakers traded for you, the vision was that eventually you're going to take over the team. And if it's not being handed to you, go take it. No one's going to complain that Anthony Davis is taking too many shots. I have not taken a po- – I have never, never in the, you know, three years that AD's been here, four years, I'll just use the three years AD's been here, there's never been a time that somebody's called in and said, hey, Al, I don't know what AD's doing. Why is he shooting so much? That never happens. The only complaint I get about Anthony Davis is he's not taking enough shots. He's not aggressive enough. Why isn't he getting to the free throw line more? It's all traits that are the opposite of selfish. So, you know, I, I, if, if I'm looking at it from an AD perspective, that's how I look at it. But if I'm looking at it from a LeBron perspective, and don't get me wrong, this has to be adjustment for LeBron James. LeBron's been the best player every single year he's been in the NBA. Every single year, every team that he's played on, he's been the best player. He's no longer the best player on the Los Angeles Lakers. He's not. Um, and frankly, he's not supposed to be. He's done his job. 20 years in, now I'm curious to see how he kind of adjusts to this as well because it certainly is an adjustment. If you're on hold, please be patient. I know we got a lot of people on there. I got Jovan Buha of The Athletic coming up. Got some questions for him. I'm going to spend a little time on some of the topics that we got into. He had uh, also a story about Patrick Beverly and what his future might be with the Los Angeles Lakers. We'll do all that coming up next. Appreciate you guys being a part of the show. Lakers talk here on 710 ESPN. All right, Lakers, a uh, chance to bounce, bounce back tomorrow. They got the Portland Trailblazers. Uh, 7.30 tip tomorrow, and Lakers obviously coming off that loss against Indiana Pacers last night. I'm sure eager to get back and uh, and play. I want to welcome in uh, Jovan Buha. You could follow him, all his social platforms, uh, at Jovan Buha, Lakers reporter for The Athletic. Uh, Jovan, thanks for taking the time, buddy. How are you? I'm doing well, man. How are you doing? Doing good, doing good. You know, I, I spent some time, and I'll, I'll get your thoughts on this. Um, it's it's interesting to see, in my opinion, there's an adjustment coming for LeBron James that I don't think he's ever had to deal with his entire career, and I think we're at that point. What I'm referring to is 
Um, he's been the best player, you know, in the league for X amount of years, but he's definitely been the best player on his team uh, ever since he walked into the NBA. And I, I don't think that's that's I don't think that's the case anymore. I think you know what Laker fans were hoping for with the franchise organization. They were hoping at some point AD becomes the best player on this team. Now, it's AD's responsibility, obviously, to do it on a consistent basis. He was injured the last couple of years. Hopefully, that's not going to be the case this year. Um, do you agree that there? this is kind of an interesting – there's an interesting adjustment for Braun to understand and realize, okay, everything's got to run through AD – when he's never really had to face that before. And I'm not saying that he didn't have times where he was in Miami Heat and was trying to figure out, oh, is it Dwayne Wade, is it Braun? But there came a point where Dwayne Wade went up to LeBron's like, God, you're the guy, so you take over. It's supposed to be you. And then, you know, obviously the Heat took over from there. Do, do you see it a similar way or, um, or do you still see Braun as the best player on this team and the most important player? I'm. It, it, it's tough. Um, I, I definitely think you, you have a point. Uh, I, I think the level that we've seen AD play at the, these last couple weeks is probably a higher a higher ceiling than we will see from LeBron this season. So, in you know, of course, I, I think it, it also came at um, you know against some easier competition. You know, facing the, the Spurs three times with. Uh, you know, Jakob Pertl not playing in, in one of the games and then leaving in the second quarter in, in the other game. And like, um, so I, and that's not to discredit AD at all, but I, I do think he, he definitely had matchup advantages in some of those games that he won't have uh, on a night to night basis, just going against smaller front lines, teams, you know, w- without starting caliber centers. Um, so I, I think I, I want to see. I guess what I'm trying to say is I want, I want to see more time and, and give it another five to ten games to, to really evaluate who I think is the better player and, and you know the, the best way to play. I do think with LeBron last night, he opened the game really well and, and had um, you know a, a quick – I forgot exactly how many points he had in, in the first quarter, but he was in double digits in the first quarter he had before 10. spraining that ankle. Mm-hmm. And I think from that point on, he, he noted you know he had a, a bit of a gimp – was not elevating as much um, and I think just was not as effective. And you saw him go two for eight in in that fourth quarter and just not really look like himself. Um, I do think overall LeBron has not played at the level that he played at last season, at the level that he's played at really is few seasons in LA. Um, So there is been a little bit of a decline there, but I'm not ready to say he's not the best player on this team yet. What I am ready to say though, is that the Lakers have to find ways to get Anthony Davis more involved. The fact that he had two shots in the fourth quarter, the fact that he had four touches in the final three minutes of that game is inexcusable. And, um, you know, whether that's AD demanding the ball more, the Lakers manufacturing touches for him more, or or just LeBron kind of putting it on himself and saying, I got to get the ball to AD. Uh, You know, he's our best or or second best player. Like, you got to do that. And I think for the Lakers, like we've seen in in some of these fourth quarters where they've kind of collapsed or, or lost close games, it's been Anthony Davis often not being involved enough. And I think the, the blame pie kind of goes to multiple parties. I I think part of it's on Darwin, part of it's on AD, part of it's on the ball handlers, but you know, whoever it's on, everyone has to collectively come together and be like, we got to get AD the ball because he, you know, does have uh, an advantage in, in most matchups, and um, he is one of the best finishers and, and one of the best big men in the league. So, I think the fact that they continually go away from him down the stretch uh, is a big mistake, regardless of whose offense it is, whose team it is. Um, you you got to find more shots for AD. You know, Jovan, may, maybe this is I such I hold such high regard and praise to LeBron that I even find a way to blame LeBron on things that are probably unfair. But I'm going to give you an example. So yesterday, LeBron took 22 shots. AD took 15. And again, I'm going to go back to this because I think you said something that leans more towards the the point that I'm trying to make. LeBron is one of the smartest players to ever play the game. Um, Obviously, he's one of the greatest to ever do it, period. I mean, I always look at these stats and so stupid to me that 
He's working on passing Kareem for most points all time, and he's not too far away from passing Magic and assists. It's like I can't even – yeah, that doesn't – that I can't comprehend all that. That's how great he's been. Um, I do think there's a responsibility to Braun to say Anthony Davis doesn't just seem like that player to me that's going to go take it. You know, there's certain players, certain great players that you don't have to hand me a baton. I'm taking the baton. There comes a point where that thing is mine, and it is now mine. I'm going to grab it. I almost feel like AD needs Braun to, hey, okay, fine. You don't got to take it the entire way. Well, hold on to it. I don't want to say hold on to it with me because they did that when they won that NBA championship. But I almost I, I feel like that last night's game is just one example of Braun – instead of you taking some of those shots, force Anthony Davis to have to take those shots. Get AD going on the offensive end. And again, I, I think it's because I I hold him to such high regard. It's like I feel like he's the sol- he could be the solution to everything. Maybe that's not fair, but that's how I that's how I view LBJ. I think that's fair. Um I think it, it's fair to put those expectations on him. And to your point on on AD too, like I think in, inherently it is more difficult for a, a big man to, you know, be a ball dominant. You, you look at usage rate and, um, you know, the, the guys who are tending to take the most shots, it, it's the Luka Doncic's or the, the Trey Young's, the LeBron's, the James Harden's. Like, th- there's a reason for guy that. With those ball guys are the, the primary ball handlers. They, they run a heliocentric offense, and, and they just have the ball all the time. Like, you know, there are some exceptions where there's a Joel Embiid or, or Nikola Jokic, but those offenses kind of funnel through them. They, they don't have a LeBron James. And in Philly, they're still kind of figuring it out with, with Embiid and Harden there. But, um, you know, in Denver, right, like Jokic is their offense. Jokic is their point guard, uh, essentially. So I think for, for AD, you know, maybe comparing him to um, even bigs of the past, I think the game is just so different that it, it's hard to, to do that. But at the same time, like the Lakers have, have often used him basically as just a roller and, and kind of like, like a Tyson Chandler type role or, or a JaVale McGee type role where it's like he's much more skilled than that as a post-up threat, an ISO threat, a, a pick-and-pop threat. Like he can do so many things. We, we saw with LeBron out uh, the, the way they were able to run the offense through him. And I, I think to, to your point, like the, there's a balance that they, they just have to find and um, I think with LeBron, you know, sometimes he, he does say he wants to pass the baton. And, you know, the, it's 80s team, 80s the best player. The offense should go through 80, but his actions don't always match that. And, and I that's agree. The one thing where I think Le- LeBron should be held accountable. The other thing too, though, and I think it, it kind of flew under the radar a little bit last night was like I thought there was a little bit too much Russell Westbrook overall, where um, with the way that the Lakers were running their offense, it, it ended up you know the ball was just. Russ was bringing the ball up, and, and there's just a lot of Russ AD pick and roll that ended up in in Russ taking you know, several shots down the stretch that I, I just don't think he should have taken. And um, you know, he, he did hit a three, he had a step back jumper over Miles Turner, but I didn't think either shot was necessarily a, a good shot or, or a high percentage shot. Um, and you know, he obviously had, he had the pull up shot that he missed. He, he had the the layup that was uh, kind of blocked, or or he just missed it. And he also had that uh, feed inside the AD that got turned over. And it was just, to me, like, the, you know, there needs to be a pecking order on this team where it's LeBron and AD are 1A and 1B. And Russ is either number two or, or number three, if, if you want to say LeBron AD is 1-2 in some order. But, like, you know, if the Lakers are, are trying to appease Russell Westbrook in crunch time, I, I think that's where now you just have too many mouths to feed. And, and it's like – no, like the pecking order is Le- LeBron's going to have the ball. He's going to, you know, be the decision maker out there. And we're going to look to get AD uh, on the block or, or in the pick and roll or, um, you know, ISOed. And then third, if Russell Westbrook has a good matchup or, or he's feeling it. And he did have a good game up until that point. But I feel like we, we've kind of seen with him in crunch time, he isn't always the best decision maker. And, and he has a tendency to look for his own shot, to, to maybe, you know, sometimes take the bait from defenses and, and take shots that you shouldn't take. And it has hurt the Lakers in crunch time, both this season and last season. So I, I really think, um, and that I, I will put more on Darvin, uh, you know, more than Russ, because he can either take him out or he can say, no, we're, we're, we're shifting LeBron more to the point guard spot and, and Russ, you're going to play off the ball. So I, I put that a little bit more on, on Darvin and, and he kind of took the blame with the offensive execution on the stretch. And I think that was kind of some of what he was talking about, but 
everyone's been talking about the, the, the isolations and, and the shot selection. And I think that falls on, on both Russ and LeBron. And the Lakers really got to figure this out because this has been a problem now really dating back to last season where they're just a bad you know, crunch time offensive team and, and they lose these close games that they shouldn't lose because they just don't know how to execute on the stretch. Well, I, I think the explanation of, you know, if if they are trying, if there is any accommodation to Russ, that doesn't make any sense to me. There doesn't need to be. You, there is no pressure there. It, you know, you, you do what you need to do to win games. And yeah, I, I don't think you have to appease to a Russell Westbrook. The people you obviously are appeasing to is LeBron and AD. Um, Jovan Buha taking some time of the athletic, joining uh, Lakers talk. Jovan, I want to get your thoughts on this. And I, and I did see... Um, you know, one of your reports specifically about Patrick Beverly, but um, I, I just want to just the scope of where the Lakers are right now. There was about a month ago, there was kind of some rumor and chatter. Hey, if anything happens, it's going to be after Thanksgiving or about 20 games in 20 to 25 games in. That's when teams get a kind of a better chance to assess whether they're they're uh, trying to win or maybe they're just kind of scaling back and saying, guys, this is not going to be the season. Let's let's start selling off some of these players. Um, December 15th is also a key date. That's when players who signed this past off season can also be dealt. Where do you think the Lakers are in finding ways to try to improve the roster? If there are specific players that you think um, are uh, have not worked so far, that could also be uh, uh, potentially uh, a part of a trade. Yeah, well, everything I've heard uh, from multiple sources is that the summer 15th is the date they are now targeting. Um, you know, I had initially heard and reported that Thanksgiving range, 20 to 25 games. Uh, but the truth is the Lakers don't feel like they have a, a great grasp uh, on this team. And, you know, with uh, LeBron missing multiple games, with AD missing a couple games, uh, with, with Dennis and Thomas not starting the season healthy, and then those guys now emerging as key rotation players. Um, I think, you know, Pat Beverly being suspended as well. Like, they, they just don't feel like, you know, yes, they, they've had the big three for uh, 10 of the 19 games, and they are only three and seven with those three playing together. But overall, they, they feel like they, they want a little bit more of a sample size to really determine – you know, what do we have here? Which pieces fit? Which pieces don't fit? Um, and, and, you know, who, who do we want to keep? Who, who do we want to flip? Now, that being said, they only have six players making more than a minimum salary. And you tend to see in trades, you, you got to have these mid-sized contracts to, to really make a deal work. Maybe you throw in a minimum salary guy as, as kind of a filler. But for the most part, it is guys making more than, than minimum salaries that are traded. So by process of elimination, you know, LeBron and AD are, are untouchable. Those two guys are, are safe. They're going to be Lakers through the rest of the season. But looking at the, the, the rest of the four guys making above the minimum, it's Lonnie Walker, Kendrick Nunn, Patrick Beverly, and, of course, Russell Westbrook. So we know Russell Westbrook has been in a bunch of trade rumors. The, the team is still actively trying to trade him, though they're unsure of, of what they want to do w- with their picks. But the other three guys, Lonnie Walker has, has been one of the steals of the offseason and has really thrived in that starting shooting guard role. Um, I, I was wrong on that. I, I was very skeptical and, and kind of against that signing, but Lonnie has been great. Um, has really kind of taken on that Malik Monk type role, uh, but has provided, you know, more athletic, better defender, not quite the shooter uh, that Malik is, but has been really solid. So it really comes down to the other two spots. And I think objectively we, we would agree that Kendrick Nunn and Patrick Beverly have probably been, the two most disappointing rotation players aside from maybe the center spot with, with, with Damian Jones, but like those two, I mean, Kendrick Nunn has not lived up to his contract um, and has been really inconsistent this season. And Patrick Beverly has still been solid de- defensively, but is averaging career lows and points, three point percentage. Uh, and, and has just really been a non-factor offensively. So I think looking at Pat and Kendrick specifically, those have been the two names that have come up a lot in, in potential deals where the Lakers could package those guys together and, and get to up uh, about $20 million combined. And then you, you throw in a first round pick potentially. And now all of a sudden th- there are a lot of options out there of um, you get upwards of, you know, 22, 25 million back in salary and, and uh, you know, throw in a pick and uh, maybe you get a, a high level starter or, or two coming back the other way. If it's a rebuilding team that, that's looking to shed some salary. So I think for, for the Lakers that they're, 
right now looking at, do we make a smaller move and we move a Pat, we move a Kendrick, we move both with potentially a pick and just keep Russ off the bench as our sixth man and, you know, get a wing in here, get another big and, you know, upgrade that way. Or do we do the big move with Russ? That's probably going to require attaching two picks and really kind of tear this thing down in terms of you know, their salary and, and bring in a Mel Turner and Buddy Heald or, or, you know, someone else. So, I think right now that they're weighing that they're, they're leaning more toward the smaller move of a, of a Pat and a, and a Kendrick or, you know, one or one or both. Um, but I think really the next five to 10 games are, are going to determine what they do of, you know, does this team show something on this six game East coast trip? Do they go four and two and, and you know, beat a Philly or, or a Toronto and, and show some life that they haven't really showed against the better teams. Like they're two and uh, 12 against teams above 500 right now. Yeah. Uh, and that's just not going to get it done moving forward. Like they have to start having some impressive wins, you know, beating some teams that are above 500 and show that this team has a pulse for them to invest in, in you know, trading a first round pick or two. If not, I think they'll look for a smaller move that, that still upgrades the roster, gives them more of a chance, but isn't going all in the way that I think you'd have to be more confident in, in this core. Jovan, uh, great stuff, buddy. Always uh, appreciate your insight. You do a fantastic job, and thank you for taking the time. All right, bud? Appreciate it, man. All right, that's Jovan Buha. Follow him on uh, all the social platforms, at Jovan Buha. Final thoughts, and I'm going to hit on something that Jovan just mentioned there, that schedule uh, that's coming up for the Lakers that I, I do think there's a lot to it will determine what this team is. We'll do all that coming up next. Lakers talk on 710 ESPN. All right, quick shout-out. Thank you to Valvoline Instant Oil Change. Great partner of Lakers Talk. Great partner on 710 ESPN. Visit SoCalOilChange.com for location and game-winning coupons off your next Valvoline Instant Oil Change. Um, I'm going to squeeze this one. Solomon, we got about 30 seconds. What do you got, buddy? I'm going to be real quick about it. LeBron, yep. LeBron, LeBron, LeBron. It is up to that dude. He was talking the talk about turning over the reins. LeBron, time to walk the walk because if he doesn't buy in i don't care what marvin ham does it ain't happening so i'm appreciate you calling in thank you for waiting as patient as you did um i, I will say i think something that uh Yovan said this schedule coming up here you got portland okay well let's let's figure that one out they're playing tonight against the clippers and then um, after that, you got the six-game road trip. You're going to know what the Lakers are. You're going to play good teams. So you're either beating some good teams along the way or you're not. And if you're not, then it does kind of tell the story that the Lakers um, can beat bad teams, but they can't beat teams that are actually going to be in the mix of it. Uh, thank you to Michael Funches. Thank you to Mara Ruiz. Thank you to Laura Romo. Appreciate everybody that tuned into the show. I'm back on tomorrow morning with Travis Rogers at 10 a.m. If you missed any part of the show, please go check out ESPN LA. Go get the app. You get all the shows, plus you get all the Lakers content with Lakers Talk. Uh, LA, as always, thank you uh, for being a part of the show. Hope you have a great rest of your night.